We are pleased to introduce to you a new sponsor here at Vote Pro Podcast, CBD. That's CBD spelled S-E-A-B-E-D-E-E. They produce premium CBD wellness products. Their products have been featured in High Times, Forbes Magazine, Thrillist, and other publications for meeting the highest standards of quality in the industry. Feel better, sleep better, recover faster with CBD, oils, edibles, topicals, skincare products, and even pet products. Their website is cbd.org, that's S-E-A-B-E-D-E-E, and their email is relief at cbd.org. Toll-free number is 866-304-5974. They're offering you 50% off for first-time customers when you use the code PODCAST50. So go check out cbd.org and place your order. The Vote Pro Podcast, the award-winning cannabis news podcast brought to you by VotePropot.com. Here are your hosts, Phil Adams, Jay Britton, and Andrew McCready's. Well, hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Vote Pro Podcast. We're awfully glad to have you with us today, and uh, today is a very special podcast because we are very pleased to have as our guest, Kim Stuck one of the nation's top experts in the field of cannabis regulatory compliance. And she's here to tell us all just what that means and what it means for folks in the industry, because it is monumentally important. She's now the founder and CEO of Allay Consulting. Please help me welcome Kim Stuck. Did I com- pronounce your name right, Kim? I just want to make yeah, sure. Yeah, you did. You actually pronounced it perfectly. It's exactly how it's spelled. <laughs> okay. I wasn't sure. I like to get people's names right. No, you're great. And you said the company name right, which most people get wrong. So nice work. <laughs> well done, Phil. For once. <laughs> <laughs> he, even a, he even a broken clock, right? Now, I gotta write this down to <laughs> make note of it. Put it on the calendar. So, Kim... Um, uh, first of all, why don't you give us a little rundown about how you got started in this? You were once on the regulatory side of things, correct? Yeah, yeah. So I, originally um, in my career, I was a wholesale food and restaurant health inspector. Okay. Um, public health investigator was the title that I mm. had um, in Denver, Colorado. I know it sounds so um, official. <laughs> and so, you know, um, during that time, during the time that I was there as a, as a wholesale food manufacturing regulator, um, cannabis became legal in 2014. Um, it was actually 2013 that it actually got passed, I believe, for adult right. use. Mm-hmm. Um, but But licenses hadn't been issued yet and all of that. So, Um, We had a little bit of time to get some stuff together and, you know, everybody kind of in the government at that time was looking at each other like we didn't think that was going to pass. Now, what do we do? And who's going to regulate this? And so they they gave that to our department um, at the health department in Denver. Um, Public health inspections was the actual like the department that took it on and okay. that's what I worked for. Yeah. So we all um, didn't know anything about cannabis. Um, you know, I grew up in Colorado and, and, you know, as you must a, have known something about yes, cannabis. Yes, we knew it. I knew enough. Um, <laughs> Come on. But, you know, I didn't know all the ins and outs. I didn't understand extraction. I didn't understand how to right. grow a plant. Right. Um, didn't know anything about, you know, making that, you know, scaling right. that and doing a legal business. So it was a huge learning curve. Um, and I went, after it with gusto. Uh, I loved the cannabis industry. It was brand new. It was fun. I wanted to learn something new. It's pretty um, exciting, I guess, right? Uh, Being yeah, on that kidding. kind on of the cutting beginning. edge. Yeah. Unbelievably exciting for a regulator because regulators don't get a lot of excitement. Um, no, I wouldn't think so. <laughs> no. So it was like, oh my gosh. And it was, it was historic, you know, right. it was like, Absolutely. wow, this is the first time a regulator has had to do something completely new in probably a long time. Yeah. So I was really stoked about it and not everybody was very stoked about it because it was a lot of work. 
Right. Um, I but I went I after it and my team was just absolutely amazing there. And um, so I learned a lot from the industry. They were like, OK, get in there. Now you got to regulate these places. So you went from being an inspector. OK, so you're walking into a grow up or or, you know, uh, looking for violations, that kind of thing to actually working for that. And that, that must have been a weird transit. I mean, when you transitioned into being a, a consultant, you went from sort of being the bad guy to the good guy, didn't you, in a way? I mean, <laughs> yeah. is that a, is it, was that a weird transition? Well, you went you? from the government side to the comp- to the client side. Right. right. Same thing. That's Which what I was saying. happens all the time. <laughs> all it the happens time. all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yes, it was very, very strange. So, so one thing about the cannabis industry is there isn't a lot of trust um, because, you know, mm. most of the people in the cannabis industry came from the black market. Black market you know, they had right. to deal with a lot of sketchy situations. They couldn't sure. trust people. Um, and so that kind of carried over. And even to this day, I kind of feel that with people. It takes once you're in the circle of trust, you're good. But Can you give us an example in, of how that played out? Like, uh, uh, where where an, an old line uh, black marketeer um, is finally legitimate, but he's still acting like a black marketeer. Well, I don't think that they still necessarily look, you know, act like a legacy legacy market, you know, thing. It's not necessarily that. It's just that they have been downtrodden and right. biased for so long that why would they trust anyone? Like sure. honestly, I don't especially blame them. the man. Right. right. And I was the man. You, you know, were the man. For years. <laughs> You're not and a man, so, but you were the man. Right. Exactly. Um, but so anyway, so it was a weird transition. I actually remember when I started my company because I couldn't really tell that many people about it. Um, I went to the ethics board and signed an NDA. I did all the things that you you should be doing mm-hmm. if you're going to you know work for the private industry. And I did all that. And I I felt like I was legit. And as a regulator, I had a really good reputation. Um, They, you know, even though I had to dispose of a lot of product and did a bunch of recalls and it was very ugly. It was a it was a hard few years, I guess, um, towards the end there, just because there were so many issues we found. Um, But I just remember the first time I went to a cannabis happy hour as a consultant, everybody (laughs) knew who I was. Everyone knew who I was. And everyone was like, what is she doing here? (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. So do you think? Oh, my God. Okay, let's back up. So you were inspecting restaurants and bars, I take it, for the most part, like for the health department. And then all of a sudden, the the government, the regulators said, what do we, how do we get, you know, we've got regulations. How do we get these inspected? And they said, well, let's give it to the health department. All of a sudden, you inherit that as part of your scope of work, I guess you could say. So do you think if that hadn't happened, you would still be in the cannabis industry like you are now? You know, I I actually think that I, I've thought about this several times, actually. <laughs> I actually think that I I would have, um, okay. only because... I, it was, it is bound to happen. Um, I really love the industry and, um, you know, I have a lot of friends that outside of the health department, um, that have offered me jobs just simply because of, you know, my work ethic and dedication. And I Mm -hmm. think eventually it would have happened, but it probably would have happened later in my life. Um, and I'm Uh. really happy that it happened now. Um, just because it, you know, I I don't know. I, I have a lot of, I, I believe in fate a little bit, I think. Sure. Um, right yeah. place, right time. And it just right. so happened. I mean, I remember the first time I was in a grow and the first time I was in an extraction lab and it was almost like things just clicked. Like I was like, man, I, you know, at the end of my day, my first day doing cannabis stuff, I was like, this is where I'm supposed to be. This ah. is what I'm supposed to be doing. I can It's a feel nice it. feeling, isn't it? Yes. That's and great. Thankfully, it all worked out. But, you know, I mean, I'm very thankful to the health department. I'm thankful to all of the amazing companies that helped me with my education and helped me really figure out the industry as well as I have. Um, But I I actually do believe that I would have ended up in it, but it would probably have been a little later in life. And I probably would have done the health department thing for quite a while because I did actually really like that job. So. You know. So last year we had Steve Fox on as a guest. Do you did you ever work with Steve? Now he's he was the fellow who did a lot of the. He was a, he's a lobbyist now, but he's an attorney who wrote uh, a lot of the Colorado um, adult use 
legislation. Did did you have occasion to work with Steve at all? So I do know who he is, um, but we actually didn't work together because when you, you know, legislation is very different than regulation. Oh, yeah. Um, so they, he really put together the framework, right? Okay. And then there's another, there's usually a committee of um, a mix of people. So, you know, um, people from industry, lawyers, um, accountants, uh, you know, those kinds of people, experts, scientists mm-hmm. that get together and actually write the regulations the after regs. a bill is passed. So I didn't, I have not worked directly with him. I think I've met him face to face before. Um, but, you know, I, we never worked hand in hand, but I'm, so thankful that everything worked out the way it did. So, so while you were in Colorado, um, on the regulator side, do you feel that you had um, a hand in in you know? I mean, regulations are kind of a fluid thing, it seems to me. And uh, uh, you know, were you able to uh, to influence some of the formation of some of them? Oh, most definitely. Um, in fact, even in other states when I was a regulator. So, ah. when, you know, when we were there, we didn't have a set of regulations. So we it, we actually had to take cur- like already existing regulations mm-hmm. um, in wholesale food manufacturing and restaurant, you know, health inspections, and then apply that to the cannabis space. So when we were in facilities, mm-hmm. we would um, break down the processes that we were seeing find where critical critical control points were happening in that process mm-hmm. and then you know demand regulations or you know demand um, processes based on the risks right. of those processes so it was really really interesting um it was a whole new learning experience we ran into so many different things that i was like whoa 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 you guys are doing this? Okay, there needs to be like some things in place so that this is safe. Yeah. Um, and then we would we would change the regulations based on that or, you know, require certain things, um, including like shelf stability approvals and things right. that don't exist in other um, places. And, you know, I'm a certified professional at food safety. So, you know, that's what my lens is, you know, naturally. But, you right. know, we... Cannabis is very, very different than any other industry that's existed. There's a lot of food safety issues Mm -hmm. that exist in cannabis that do not exist anywhere else. And that was what was so shocking to me. Because in my head, I was like, oh, it's the same as all wholesale food. This is going to be fine. No worries. We got this. And then when we dug into it, we went, holy (laughs) cow, mycotoxins and heavy metals and pesticides that we never thought about. Oops. Um, You know, all of these things. And so, you know, throughout time, because of all the recalls and the issues that we had to go through, obviously that changed. In fact, I'm part of the MED um, policy and advisory board. And we just, they just put CAPA plans into their regulations, which is a food safety standard. So they're also seeing the reasons for changing yeah. stuff. Yeah, mycotoxins is a smart person's word for mold, I think, right? So it's right. the toxin that certain molds create. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that, I mean, that kind of leads to a question that's sort of obvious, and that is, Kim, do you think that the cannabis industry is overregulated? I mean, if you compare it to your experiences in the past with, you know, restaurant inspections and stuff, or even with FDA and, and, and food and so forth, because there are a lot of complaints by folks in the industry. I, I don't know enough about it to say, but what are your thoughts on 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 the whether or not this industry is more regulated, more closely watched? It's certainly more you know, have it's certainly more expensive to get into. It's certainly higher taxed. Do you think it's higher? The, the regulations are more restrictive. Uh, this is the unpopular opinion, but no, I don't. I don't think it is at all. You look at wholesale food manufacturing compared to an mm-hmm. extraction lab. Let's say, let's just use Colorado as a baseline, right? Okay. THC manufacturers, so they have to deal. It depends on which county. If you're in Denver County, you have a health department, right? right. Any most other counties do not regulate at all. Um, when it comes to health and safety. Then you have the MED, right? And the Department of Agriculture. So you have Mm -hmm. to follow those regulations. In every other wholesale food industry, if you have a wholesale food manufacturing, not only do you have, you know, your state and local health department, um, you also have the the FDA, 
Right. You have OSHA, right. which is a huge right. tiny sure. problem. Right. Work, workplace safety. Yeah. yeah and then on top of that, in the wholesale food manufacturing world, most ingredient companies, aka oil companies, right? If if it's equivalent to the cannabis industry, they have to have GMP certification at least in order to sell their product anywhere. And GMP certification is like FDA regulations, but you know, all this documentation and logging and things like that. So mm. no, I don't think that they're as regulated as they think that they are. I do believe that they are over-regulated in some areas though, licensing things and, and stuff like that. I think that um, they're still working out kinks. So I do think that they have room to complain a little bit because there are some things in the regulations that make zero sense and could be streamlined and it is very expensive and license applications, you know, that, oh, that yeah. kind of, oh my gosh. And the competitiveness to licenses in different places. I mean, it's hard. Um, so I'm yeah. not saying that they don't have room to, you know, complain mm -hmm. to a certain degree, but I don't think that most people in the industry understand what federal legalization is going to do to them. It is going to be very hard. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let's, let's, let's dive into that. What is, but before we do that, let I'm just curious, are, are there some states that you see that are really doing it right as compared to some others? Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> I think all of them are kind of doing it wrong and kind of doing it right. Actually, okay. I do okay. like the Michigan regulations that just came out. Okay. They're probably the best ones I've seen in a while. Um, but you look at like Oklahoma or some of those other places and I'm just like, what is this 13 page rubbish? You know, this isn't, this is so vague that nobody can really follow it. Um, you know, you, you sh really shouldn't be writing regulations that are just completely vague and the right, government right. does governments do that sometimes so that they can just decide halfway through if something is wrong or not, um, which is not a good way to write regulations. So, Agreed. um, Colorado's getting there. You know, we went through a lot um, back in the day. We messed it up royally. <laughs> um, and now we're fixing it or trying to. And the problem with regulations is my opinion is very different than other people's opinions. No matter what, it's kind of subjective. You know, what I think should be in regulations, other people are like, no, we don't need that. And then Oh, you know, yeah. Other, yeah. So there are probably as many opinions about regulation as there are regulators. Exactly. If not more. Yeah. If because, not more, because everybody's got a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't I think everybody's getting it right and getting it wrong and, and getting it wrong. But that's federalism, yeah. which is a good thing. Yes. And each state has its own culture of people. Mm -hmm. So you have to also take that into consideration as well. Some of the regulations in Colorado are not going to work in South Carolina or Michigan or, you know, right. so it's, you know, it kind of all depends. But I think we're slowly working on it. Every state is slowly working on it. OK, now I want to get back to real quick before Jay, uh, uh, Jay has one queued up, I'm sure uh, you, you were talking about People don't know what they're in for once federal uh, prohibition is lifted. What what kinds of things are we looking at? <laughs> so this is essentially why I have a business. Um, you know, most of the regulations that our company works with um, are those higher level regulations. Obviously, you know, state regulations are very important. We know them very well. We can do audits to that. We can help you write SOPs. We can, you know, walk you through the regulations and answer questions and help you with licensing and floor plans and all of that. But our biggest reason for existing and most of our clients are actually looking at that long term. Mm -hmm. um, they're thinking eventually this is going to be federally legal. I mm -hmm. want to be ready for it. And I also want to be ready for things like international sales. Um, they're right. not. Yeah. So they are really great companies that really want to do the right thing. They want a food safety plan in place because they also don't want to poison anybody, which is great. Um, so we really focus on FDA, OSHA. Um, mm -hmm. We deal with international fire code. We do GMP certification, ISO 9001, ISO 22000. We do like organic certification, those kinds of higher level compliances than just the state regulatory body. Um, and, and yes, they are in for a whole lot, mostly a bunch of food safety stuff and worker safety stuff. And yeah. 
they are the highest fining departments in the United States <laughs> because if you're endangering consumers, you're right. in trouble. If you're sure. danger- endangering workers, you're in trouble. Um, and so those are, you know, those standards, it's hard. I mean, to go through a whole list would take, you know, days. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sure. But, you know, it's, it's you know, what we got to be aware of. People in the industry complained about, you know, the regulations changing and the difficulties and so forth in their state. You, you've really made me think about that. What happens, which it's it's coming, it's around the corner. This becomes federal, federally legal and you have, you know, transportation across state lines and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Boy, are they, is it, you're going to be so busy. <laughs> you're going to have offices <laughs> in every state. You're going to have hundreds of employees, man. Well, I, I got, we hope. I that, mean, that's not a problem, is it? <laughs> okay, here's one. Well, that's you. a problem you want to have. <laughs> that's a problem you want to have. Tell us some horror stories. All the times you spent <laughs> inspecting, you know, grow ops in the early days and, you know, dispensaries, but, you know, yeah. processing Jay, plants. Jay's going to drop in some ominous music. On yeah, right here, man. <laughs> so have, has anything weird, scary, or, or dangerous happened to you in those uh, oh, inspections? Oh, my gosh. Like, yeah, all the time. So, awesome. I mean, I've been, yeah. So um, I've disposed of a lot of product. We'll just say that much. Um, you know, back when I was an investigator, the black market was still going strong. And right. so there were times that I would accidentally go into a grow that was not a legal grow. It was unlicensed Ooh. on accident, but it was maybe in the same building. So I have definitely been shot at before. Whoa. Um, and <laughs> I wasn't thinking that. I, I wasn't even <laughs> expecting that. Yeah. No, Man. they actually, um, what they the hell? bulletproof vests <laughs> to the cannabis team when I was there. And I'm you are my hero, my Kim. Now. Holy uh, yeah. <laughs> You're badass. Seriously. <laughs> It was more, I mean, I I don't think that they were, were meaning to like hurt me, but they just were scaring no, me. No, they were just shooting a gun at you. <laughs> it worked pretty well. Um, wow, no kidding. Yeah, oh yeah, there there was some really weird stuff going on. Um, you know, there, there's there been a lot of gross stuff that I've seen. Yeah. Um, in fact, yeah. I'm very, very picky on any cannabis that I consume because of all the craziness I've seen. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Man, that's crazy. <laughs> I was expecting you to say, you know, uh, you know, this something minor, you know. <laughs> well, you said scary and that was the scared, how scared I've been. Oh, we found a snake crawling through the grow up. You know, that would be enough for me. This is a really good one. Um, so the, one of the first um, recalls that we did that I was I was on site for, but actually one of our, the senior um, investigators at this time, because there was nine of us in the department. And so all nine of us were tasked to do cannabis at first until they were like, OK, this is a much bigger job. Kim, will you be the cannabis specialist and you only do cannabis and do that? And I said, yeah. So one of the times um, people were making bubble hash in a an old washing machine that they got off of Craigslist. And Ooh. the reason why it came to our attention was somebody called in a complaint about the hash that they bought. It had rust chunks in it and had like dog hair in the actual Ooh. hash. And so we went and like <laughs> checked it out. And then they were using that hash and putting it in like brownie mix as well. So we had oh, to recall sure. everything and, you know, write a cease and desist. I mean, th- that kind of stuff happens all the time. I found um, homemade extraction equipment that was rusting on the inside as well. That was that's actually fairly common. That's wow. why we require UL equipment. But back in the day, nobody was making extractors, right? They had to make them themselves. So it was like very weird. Um, I've been in places that have had alligators as pets. <laughs> um, no joke. True story. Wow. And I actually think that there is a dispensary in Denver that has an alligator like in their dispensary, um, which is pretty funny. And wow. yeah, <laughs> I've been Why not? in grow facilities that literally had a carpet on the ground uh, yeah. mold and algae that we oh create. good oh, nice yeah. all like up the plants and everything and they could not understand why we were not okay with that um it was really yeah we've seen some like black mold issues we've seen pesticide issues like you wouldn't believe um you know it oh, was just God. yeah it was that. so that's kind of scary too <laughs> No kidding. Well, Jay, you asked for horror stories. You got some. No kidding. I wasn't expecting. You know, the Netflix should make a show app, you know, based on your life or something, man. If, <laughs> that's if Netflix crazy. That's... followed around a health inspector, I think it would <laughs> really? shock a lot of people to tell no you. No <laughs> kidding. Like like Murder Mountain. I guess you saw that. That's yeah. pretty crazy stuff, that. man. Well, yeah. you know, I, I 
as a young man, I worked in a lot of restaurants. As a, as an adult now, I try not to think about what goes on in the kitchen. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. I'd rather not know. So, Kim, um, so we, we talk a lot about manufacturing and grow operations. What about dispensaries? What are some of the things they have to uh, comply with? So really, they will have to comply with the state regulations. There are health departments at a local level that do come in. So we did used to um, inspect dispensaries, but mainly, be, you know, we would come in, make sure that they weren't selling any items that weren't licensed items. So back mm-hmm. in the day, I think the first dispensary I ever went into, this little old lady was running it, and it she had a bunch of brownies that had no labels on them, right? No, no <laughs> labels at all. They were just wrapped in plastic. She was making them at home and bringing them in and selling them. And, you know, that's like the old days. <laughs> yeah, that's not allowed. Yeah. Um, yeah. You have to have a licensed facility to make anything that's edible and sold to the public. You have to, you know, that kind of thing. Um, Cause God knows what she has at home with cats no and kids and dogs Ooh. and <laughs> Exactly. So, um, and also it has to be labeled correctly, right? We have very strict labeling laws for a reason, because if that brownie goes home with somebody and it's just sitting out, a little kid's going to eat that. Um, So, and it wasn't, there was no, you know, packaging at that point. That was like way early, Um, no packaging rules yet. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that, you know, people need to think about that maybe don't think about them. Does everybody that's New getting into the cannabis industry need you need a a compliance consultant? Oh, that's a hard question. Um, I mean, of course, I want to. I would think they would. I mean, just it's so complex. (laughs) It is very complex. Um, but you know, people do it. I think that I okay, so the the just to avoid the mistakes, if nothing else, yeah. And the name of my company is Allay, and Allay is actually an English word and it means to calm or soothe stress and anxiety. And the reason I named it that is because that's exactly what we do. So it's a great name. Getting into yeah, that's a great industry, name. Yeah, I love it. Um, when people are getting into the industry, it, you know, it depends on how well they want to sleep at night. You know, <laughs> if they <laughs> want to hire a consultant to help them through the whole process of at least getting their like SOPs in place and training their staff, then we're a perfect fit. You know, and if, sure. if they, you know, but not everybody can afford, you know, to have a consultant and not everybody thinks that, you know, they need it. And need is a very different word as to like, this would be make my life a hundred percent easier. Um, when it comes to GMP certification or ISO certification, yeah, I think that need might be the word unless you want to, you know, do it for three years and pay all your employees to work on it. It's a huge, heavy lift. Um, and when it comes to OSHA, I would say need might be, be a good word um, mm-hmm. because, you know, that worker safety, you can't mess around with that. And if you yeah. don't do no, that, one incident but, and you're out of business. Exactly. And then FDA as well. Food safety, unless you're a food safety professional like myself or my team, it's really hard to identify where dangers are. And if you... Uh hurt somebody or, you know, God forbid, kill somebody, Mm -hmm. um, it's a problem. You will, you will go to prison. Um, It is not, you know, people don't mess around with that anymore. So, you know, it just depends on how much risk they're willing to take and how much sleep Mm -hmm. they want to get. Now, it seems to me, Kim, then, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but the, the cannabis industry being what it is and coming from the legacy that it that it has. Um, it seems to me that government regulators are just looking for ways to to gig somebody, um, mu- probably more so than other industries. Uh, is, is that a, is that an accurate assessment or is that off base? Um, I, you know, it depends on the state. Like, I felt like our department was not biased against cannabis. We actually were very excited about it, but we all okay. grew you know, we're a Colorado government. We didn't it's a different we culture. Even, yeah. yeah, we weren't even drug tested for Christ's sakes. Like, right, you exactly. know, I mean, so but when I talk to FDA regulators, it's a much different conversation. Right. In fact, when I is. yeah, when I worked <laughs> for our department, you know, our we're supposed to reach out to the FDA if we run into a situation that we don't understand. And then we're supposed to use the FDA's guidance that is written in our freaking handbook. No when I would call the FDA. Um, and mention the word cannabis, they would literally hang up on me. <laughs> wow. Nice. I'm not wow. kidding. And now, have yeah. they have they even yet 
released the uh, the FDA guidance on hemp industry and can and uh, cannabis or uh, CBD yet? No, um, they keep Unbelievable. pushing it out, and it it's you know I could rant about this all day long, yeah, but I it, bet. Is, it is so unethical. We. It is unethical. It is absolutely because there are people in this. It was supposed world. to come out a year ago. At yes, least. over a year ago. Over a year ago, right. And, right. Um, and These there poor are people- farmers and businesses are just sitting there with their thumbs up their rears trying to figure out what to do with their crops and what to do with their... It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's just... It is. It's criminal. It is because all it is, all it's doing is creating an environment where food safety doesn't matter and and an environment right. where the cannabis industry can have another black eye. All it takes is one person dying or getting right. viciously ill. Um, and it's already happening. I mean, there have is been it? so many accounts of people getting sick. You know, C, I think it was CNN or CNBC took a bunch of CBD uh, products off of a shelf and tested them themselves in an in-house lab, and most of them didn't have any CBD in them at all. Yeah, I mean, this a is a story problem. on that. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge problem. I'm, you know, slightly infuriated with the FDA for not having something in place by now. Um, but at the same time, you know, what can the industry do? And that's kind of where our company has come in: is hey, we'll be your personal food safety experts, your personal health department. And we will come in and make sure that you're at the standards, that you're protecting your consumers mm-hmm. because real companies, companies that actually care, they care about their consumers and they don't want to give them something that could potentially harm them. And Absolutely not. Yeah. So they kind of, I mean, it's, it's total BS, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of really great companies out there that are doing the right thing. And, and thankfully, you know, there are, or else I probably wouldn't be in business. <laughs> So do you do testing? Does your company do testing or? or? So we do not own a lab, no, but we do partner with several labs right, in okay. different states. Yeah. So we kind of find the best of the best. And then that's where we we do take samples um, and then we send them to those labs. So, yes, testing is part of uh, one of the things that we help with. Sure. How how large does uh, Department of Agriculture regs uh, figure into this? Is that a big part of it or is it mostly FDA? So, um, so the Department of Agriculture actually leaves things to the states. So okay. each state, like California Department of Agriculture regulations are vastly different than like the Oregon ones. Oh. Um, yeah. And, and that's kind of the way that the federal government left it. There is kind of an overarching uh, Department of Agriculture, but it's, the, you know, it, that's the USDA. Right. So the right. USDA kind of runs all of that stuff. They deal with organic certifications and things okay. like that. But they pretty much leave those rules to the states. And the USDA actually has come out with hemp rules. I actually helped write um, the hemp plan for Colorado, which got rejected. And now we're rewriting again. But right. um, but the USDA actually has released some stuff. And, and I understand that the FDA was waiting on the USDA because when you're writing two sets of regulations, having one first helps you back up to that regulation and you get less crossover. So right. it was smart for them to wait until those regulations were out. Mm-hmm. But at this point, it's, you know, it's just a huge injustice to, to the industry yeah. to wait this long. Cause it to is, just drag their feet this long. Oh yeah. It's, it's kind of getting bad out there. So we're excited to see those regulations when they come out. Psilocybin. Yeah. You guys have a branch now and you, you do consulting regarding that industry, brand new industry. What are your yeah. thoughts on psilocybin? I mean, in terms of its legalization, and is it going to move as quickly as as cannabis legalization has across the country, or what? Uh, so, te- so the decriminalization of psilocybin, I think, is going to spread like wildfire. Um, that's an easy yeah. step. Um, you know, it, it's a drug that ha- can do harm if it's done, you know, completely wrong. But it's not like heroin, where you know you're going to have a bunch of deaths. Um, it's right. not quite that bad. So. You know, um, I, I I don't know. And, it's, the, the, and it would appear to me because of the way it's grown, it, it would be essential to have folks like you or to have regulators, I should say, um, really watch how that's being grown. I would I mean, I, I don't know anything about it, but I would think you'd be more susceptible to molds and things like that because it's a fungus. Right. I mean, yeah. Am I right. Yeah. So it's very, very affected. Um, the substrate is really, really affected by contamination. So there's a lot okay. of steps and procedures um, that growers take to make sure that their substrate is clean before 
um, presenting the spores to it. So yeah, there's a lot of things um, going on with psilocybin that's awesome. Cool. 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 Well, Kim, where can folks get in touch with you if they need or want uh, help with their regulatory consulting? So um, they can go to our website at www.alayconsulting.com, and that's A-L-L-A-Y consulting. Um, or, you know, they can, you know, visit our website. There's a lot of um, good information on there, and they can reach out via there. Very good. And if there's one thought you want to leave our listeners, especially industry folks with, what would what would that be? Um, be proactive. <laughs> Do, you know, think about the future of your company Think about the things that are going that could happen down the line that could affect you, and you know, do something now if you can uh, to prevent bad things from happening to you. You know, I think that on so many levels, not just compliance, um, you need to be proactive. We've been speaking with Kim Stuck, founder and CEO of Alay Consulting in Oregon and uh, expert in the cannabis regulatory field. Um, And if you want to know more about that, once again, um, and we're going to put uh, this in our show description, alayconsulting.com, A-L-L-A-Y, consulting.com, all one word. Well, not the .com part, but, you know, the rest of it. (laughs) They get it. Yeah, they, okay. Um, Send us your questions, your comments. We'll make sure they get passed along. Check us out at votepropot.com. Uh, go to Apple Podcasts. Give us a five-star rating if you're a swell gal or guy. Uh, Jay, what else? Send us an email at podcast at votepropot.com. Call our message line 240-257-2441. All right. And, of course, as always, there is so much more information that you can get on our social media platforms. Go to Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. Twitter. And just do a search for Vote Pro Pot.